Okay, folks, uh, sorry for the delay. Um, thank you very much for coming to the host tech talk. This is Xi Peng Xiao from Huawei. Um, there are a million IPv6 talks, right? So I first want to answer the question why you should also listen to this one. Um, the reason is that, that I think that most IPv6 talks are given by IPv6 supporters. And usually the IPv6 supporters only tell you the good thing about IPv6. And I think that what's unique in today's presentation is that we are going to talk about a lot of the challenges facing IPv6. And the reason why I feel that this is important and useful is that just like, you know, nobody is perfect, no technology is perfect, you know, every technology has certain problems. And in order to get all the people on board to deploy IPv6, we really need to acknowledge the challenges, certain challenges that's facing IPv6, document the challenges, um, and possibly provide a guideline. And I think that uh, Eric Linker kind of like set a good example for us in RFC 1999, because RFC 1999 basically document all the IPv6 security issues and provide the guidelines. This way, you know, people feel more confidence that, oh, you know, IETF know all the issues and, you know, they are solving it. This is actually, you know, provide more confidence, not less confidence. So with that, um, I really want to say that we spent a lot of time presenting, uh, preparing for this uh, presentation and a lot of people provided a lot of, uh, you know, either statistics or provide a lot of review. And the list is long. And here, I really, again, want to thank uh, Eric Binker because he provided a lot of, you know, very detailed feedbacks. So the first part is the momentum. Um, while this is both for the IPv6 supporters and the uh, IPv6 deniers, and by IPv6 denier, I really have no disrespect, you know, just an easier name to, to refer to the camp. I know that the IPv6, for example, in the nano, uh, in the nano mailing leaks, there was a big debate this month about IPv6 and some people are complaining that oh, IPv6 is not easy to deploy, there's no uh, end user demand, etc. Um, while we acknowledge that later, here we want to say that, you know, for many of these, are you aware of the IPv6 progress in the recent years? Because 10 years ago, if you are questioning IPv6, you are more or less justified because at that time, there's almost zero IPv6 users. But now, uh, according to this Google stats, we already have 36% uh, IPv6 users. Um, some people argue that actually, uh, due to the way Google count the users, many uh, IPv6 users in China are actually mixed. So if you count also the users in China, it could be as high as uh, 45% based on the ETSI uh, study. But while IPv6 go very fast, the, the uh, it's very uneven. And this will have a major uh, implication later that we will talk about. So what's driving this IPv6 momentum? Uh, according to Jeff Houston, this is, you know, the GDP per capita, you know, rich country usually are more enthusiastic in doing IPv6, the user grows like a reliance, and then IPv4 shortage, and also the competition. But it's not just this, it's not just this. And here we'd like to offer our uh, perspective, other, you know, strong momentum on IPv6. The first one is that we believe that the readiness of uh, IPv6 value chain is something very important because the UEs, the network and the application chain is finally ready. Because 10 years ago, if you know some of these, the content are not ready, then even if operator deploy IPv6, you are not going to get much uh, benefit, but now it's very different. And here we list some of the major milestones but the slide is busy, so you don't need to read that. All I want you to know is that 
is summarized in these two blue bars. By 2011, IETF largely get the uh, solution ready. Um, by 2017, the UEs, the UEs, and the big application like you know uh, Google, Netflix are, are already. And this year, we believe that there is another important milestone that many people may not realize yet is the public cloud support of uh, IPv6 like uh, Azure and, and AWS. These are important. We will talk about why you know this is uh, this may be uh, quite significant. And then on the value chain, uh, we are seeing that the network is still slightly behind the UE um, the content. And if you are interested, I will not go into detail. If you are interested, you know, later we can discuss why you know the network is 42%, how we computed that, etc. Um, another point is that I don't know whether the IPv6 the, the denier realized that the price of IPv4 is going up so quickly. And specifically, the price doubled uh, last year. And if you count it from 2014, it already increased seven times. So if you the world on IPv4, you may have to spend a lot more money if you have to buy IPv4 address. Or for some operator, they are even considering, you know, going to IPv6 quickly. And while IPv4, you know, price is very high, they can sell their IPv4 address. This is important one. And then the public IPv6, we, this is the kind of like other momentum that we saw. Um, one is this, uh, just now we mentioned the uh, AWS Azure support of IPv6. Why we believe that this is uh, maybe very important. We, we, when we look at the operators, you know, the big operating systems, the small and medium enterprise, we find that small and medium enterprise have the least motivation to move to IPv6 because they, they have a very, you know, they don't need a many address. And also they may not have the technical expertise to make the move. So usually, you know, we, if we look at the SME, you know, there's a huge number of SME, they are simply in, in IPv4. But we believe that when these, you know, uh, AWS, Azure, when they support IPv6 and as the, you know, SME go to the cloud, you know, uh, AWS may enable them to move to IPv6 very quickly. In the past, they may have to do a lot of work themselves. But now they simply select IPv4 or IPv6. And if they select IPv6, they go IPv6. So we may, you know, today in the V6 uh, ops uh, working group, there's a discussion, we were, you know, how to move the SME. And we believe that this may be a, a, a very big uh, momentum. And then on the IoT, you probably see the number already. There's a lot of uh, IoT device. And then 5G bring new bio and new uh, opportunity. And then obviously there's these uh, innovations on top of uh, IPv6, like SRv6 and other things for provide better traffic engineering, network programming, etc. So for the people who don't believe in IPv6, I think that we really want to. These are some of the recent progress, not to mention the, for example, the big government pushes, you know, US government is pushing towards IPv6, uh, Chinese government is pushing, but I guess maybe IETF people don't want government regulation, so I avoid them here. And the second part, I think that the first part is more to the IPv6 deniers. And the second part is more to the IPv6 supporters. Um, here, what we want to say is that for the IPv6 supporters, there, there really are more challenges than you think, because, you know, we as the, the, the supporters, sometimes we feel that, oh, you know, uh, our work, IETF work is done, you know, these people are not doing IPv6 just because of the lack of the uh, motivation or because they are, they are saying all kinds of excuses. You know, I am completely ready. And what I want to say here is that, yeah, we are we are quite ready, but not completely. And let's see. So first, this is a survey from every Nick. It's done in 2017. You can say that, oh, 2017 may be too old. But actually, you know, 
based on what I hear from other industry forums, if I compare it to some of the IPv6 challenges in, in December last year, it didn't change that much. And really, uh, here, I think that it may be difficult for you to, to see uh, all the things, but I just want to kind of like quickly classify them into four categories. One is motivation. I think that for IPv6, this like motivation is always one of the biggest uh, issue. Okay, you know, my end user don't care about IPv6. It's a lot of work. So, you know, why should I? So things like this. And then knowledge is also a big part. You know, okay, you know, I don't understand IPv6. There are so many new protocols. That's, that's difficult. So I think that's a big part. Uh, ecosystem is the value chain that we talk about, the UEs, you know, is my, does my CPE support uh, IPv6 and the network, the routers, et cetera. And then technology is what's closely related to IETF that we will focus on today. So regarding this uh, motivation knowledge, I think that, you know, this uh, slide look a little deeper. I think that maybe we focus on the, the more uh, technical part is the technology, is the technology. So there are the legacy device as the IPv6, the network management system. I think generally this is a field that, you know, IPv6 network management compared to IPv4. I think that, you know, there's still uh, some work to do. And the OAM also may be not as uh, mature. These are the, some of the, you know, common complaints from the field. But we want to say that, yes, th these are issues, but, you know, the industry largely, you know, taking uh, action to, to deal with them. So regarding the motivation and knowledge, you know, leading operators are sharing their experience. And then, you know, there's many IPv6 forums, councils. I think as far as I know, the UK IPv6 council uh, is, is especially, you know, active and they are doing a lot of good work. And then for the ecosystem, I think that we should really thank, you know, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, I think Microsoft, uh, they really did a lot of work, Apple, they really did a lot of work to move the industry uh, towards uh, IPv6. Um, for the last part, for the last part, we are going to talk about the technical challenge. I think that it's the focus of our presentation today. So uh, before we talk about the bad things, uh, first let's uh, uh, let's say that you know IETF has done a lot. So you know this is not to to complain. This is not to to complain. But even though that we have done a lot, I think that there are remaining challenges. There are remaining challenges. Um, so the first one, I think that you know to compare the IPv6 performance versus IPv4. Uh, may be a uh, very relevant and more telling because it, between IPv6 and IPv4, there are so many things that you can compare. There are so many things that you can compare. For example, neighbor discovery is very different from app, but we believe that you know performance is really the the very important or maybe the most important you know uh, KPI. So the first one is regarding the road trip uh, time, the latency. So as you can say, okay, you can see here over the years, the, the uh, IPv6 road trip time uh, is, you know, constantly improving, is constantly improving. But today it's still, you know, 2.5 millisecond higher than IPv4, than IPv4. But this is world average. This is world average. You know, later I will provide, you know, kind of like the, 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 the grain of salt on my own, you know, uh, this data. And again, this is based on Jeff Houston's statics in AP Nix. There are, you know, in the industry, there are some other statistics, like Binker.org have some statics, right? NCC have statics, et cetera. But we, or at least I personally believe that maybe AP Nix data is more systematic. So we are, so I think that uh, first is that, you know, IPv6 and IPv4 is very, very close, but it's slightly higher on a worldwide average scale. So uh, I think a very good question to ask here is that what are the top three factors 
leading to this improvement. Why, you know, over the years, why this is improving? And if we understand what are contributing to this improvement, then I think that, you know, we can provide a guideline for, for other operators that, oh, you know, do this from day one. Then, you know, you can, you can, you know, avoid uh, certain things. So this is the, the logic time. The second one is the packet loss uh, rate. And we find that the data here is really inconclusive. Um, we provide, you know, two data points here. The first one is from this uh, Hinda V um, uh, in report that IPv6 PLR actually uh, lower than uh, IPv4. And this is, they, they did the measurement based on one week of measurement from, uh, from China. And it says that, you know, for them, they find out that IPv6 uh, packet loss rate is 0.25%. Um, for IPv4, it's 0.33%. So IPv6 performs slightly better. They also have some, you know, distribution uh, showing that Asia is is much better. It's all, all clearly better IPv6 than IPv4. And for other regions, they are more or less similar, more or less similar. And then we also that's one data point on one angle. And then on the right hand side, we are seeing kind of like a different result. So here we are citing, you know, RFC 7872 by, I think by Fernando, by Jane Linkova here. Um, now, I think recently, uh, Eric Winker also have the so-called drug gems uh, talking about some new management on, on this like uh, extension headers. But uh, the, the long story short, the result is that, you know, in 2017, the packet loss rate for, for the packet with fragmentation is extremely high, 21%. And even last year, it's still 8%. It improved a lot, but it's still very high. Um, because we heard from many operators, we heard from many operators that their IPv4 packet loss rate or their packet loss rate is about 0.1%, and we take it as IPv4 because many most traffic is still uh, IPv4. Um, but you know, that's really, I think that we find in the industry, but there is no data on IPv6 packet loss rate, or at least AP Nick didn't provide it, we, we, we find, but we didn't find it. So if anybody have this data, we would love to hear from you. So if we take it from the, the first study at 0 0.2%, uh, five percent then ipv6 is uh, higher than ipv4 but again this is inconclusive um we 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 don't know uh how much of this overall packet loss rate is coming from those fragmentation extension headers etc we believe that this would be a uh, you know something good to to find out um we we we, we really feel that you know if we can dig into this and find out why, you know, IPv6 is losing packet, et cetera, again, this would help, would help uh, to, to improve the performance and make the, the life of those deployer a little easier. And the third one is the TCP failure rate. Again, we can see that the, the blue one, the green one is IPv6, and then the other is V4. We can see that uh, over time, uh, the, IPv6 TCP failure rate is like again constantly improving, but I think that based on the data uh, today, uh, AP NIC, it's still you know 0.96 percent. And IPv4, you know, depending on how you look at it, it may be like 0.25 percent, or some people Jeff Houston said that oh it's almost like zero percent. So you know IPv4 is almost you know, successful. But anyhow, I think that the conclusion is the same. Uh, TCP failure rate, uh, IPv6 is higher. So the question is that, is it because of the higher packet loss rate of uh, IPv6? I think that this would certainly, you know, if you have a higher IPv6 uh, PLR, it's quite likely that the TCP failure rate will also be higher. And then, because Quick is using more and more, in addition to be able to measuring TCP failure rates, we also be measuring quick as well. 
So I think that these are some of the good questions. Um, okay, you know, me as a supporter, IPv6 supporter, talking about IPv6 challenges here. And some people say that, oh, then that may be concerned that, okay, you know, I come to the conclusion that we shouldn't do IPv6. And I want to tell you that this is not the case because again, the just now what we're presenting is the worldwide average. A worldwide average can, you know, the average can hide a lot of things, can hide a lot of things. And if we look at the data, you know, more carefully, we will see that, you know, the world average can be jerked down by a region badly. And again, this is the same stats from APNIC. You see that, you know, the whole world, uh, the RTT of uh, IPv6 is slightly higher, but it's largely, you know, because of, you know, Oceania. And if you look at the world, you know, America and Europe, actually, you know, IPv6 perform better than IPv4. So I, I, I really feel that these data are useful for, for communicating with the IPv6 deniers, you know, when they say that, oh, it's bad, you can, you, 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 you have the steps to, to tell them that what, uh, if you look deeper, what's the case. And also there are reports that IPv6 can perform better in enterprises. For example, we, we provide the two references here. You know, uh, Apple at one place is claiming that, you know, IPv6 can be, you know, 40% better uh, in, the, in the data center. Again, you know, we provided the reference here, you can check out. And um, Facebook is also very enthusiastic in, in, in uh, promoting IPv6. So I think the, the point here, our real point, our real point here is that IPv6 can perform better than IPv4 if, if you, you have a lot of talent, if you can do it, you know, uh, correctly. But it's not always easy. This is, this is like a complicated machine. And if you install it, you know, uh, correctly, you operate it correctly, then it perform better than uh, IPv4. But because it's due to its comp complexity, you may make mistakes. And if you make mistakes, then it don't uh, work uh, that well. So I think that this is the caution that we want to want, want to provide. Um, as a consequence, I think that this is also another thing that I find as a big surprise to me last year. Um, it may actually be a big surprise to many IPv6 veterans is that Many operators, uh, IPv6 deployment are actually in overlay. And in the underlay, in the router, et cetera, they're actually tunneling IPv6 in NPLS, et cetera. So, you know, when an operator tell you that, oh, I do dual stack, you think that, you know, their routers are transporting IPv6 traffic natively. You think that their underlay is also dual stack. But that may not be the case. That may not be the case. This is a big surprise for me uh, last year. So first of all, let us uh, let me clarify what's overlay and what's underlay. I think that this is, this is a notion It's applicable to operators and to some extent also uh, applicable to, to data center, but it's not applicable to for enterprise. If you are not providing a service to other people, you really don't have this like, distinction between overlay and underlay. But anyhow, for operator, Overlay is the service layer, and it involves the, the user device, and also the mobile gateway, your BNG, or et cetera. This is your, your kind of like your service layer. And then underlay is your routers, et cetera, is the, 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 the to send the, send the packet. Um, because IPv6 is, I think that the, the number one uh, reason is to address this address sorties, you know, to provide enough address. And if to do that, then IPv6 at the overlay is sufficient, is sufficient. And why operator don't want to, you know, many operators uh, don't do native I, IPv6 package transport is because if your router is dual stack, really dual stack, then you need a a uh, uh, control plane, management plane, data plane for IPv4, 
you have need a separate plan for IPv6. However, if you just tunnel IPv6 packet inside IPv4, then you only need a single, you know, data and control and management plan. So many operators feel that, okay, you know, uh, actually it will be easier for me to maintain just one per plan than two separate plan. And there are many of them are using 6PE, et cetera. So uh, some of the IPv6 veterans thought that operators IPv6 is largely done, but this is really not the case. First, there are many big operators still doing IPv4. And even for those already deployed IPv6, the IPv6 may still just in the overlay, not much in the underlay. So this is again, you know, back to the question that we need to make IPv6 perform better. We need to identify the challenges and make IPv6 perform better than IPv4. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, there are still a big part of operator network can remain in IPv4, uh, you know, there are there are many consequences. So here, uh, how to make IPv6 perform better than IPv4? Uh, there are these answers. The first two came from Jeff Houston. The first two points came from Jeff Houston. He actually have three points, but I had to delete one point because you know that point received a lot of protest. The deleted point is that he said that you should avoid stateful. IPv4 to IPv6 transition. And that would kind of like, you know, exclude, for example, 446x lab, et cetera. I receive a lot of, you know, protests from, from that point. So, you know, in the end, I delete it. Um, there are other points. The, the next five points, you know, below the below this, the, the white space, the, the other six points are, the five points are, you know, based on our uh, analysis. First is move content closer to end user. This will improve both IPv4 performance and IPv6 performance. But there are data showing that you know the improvement for IPv6 is actually uh, bigger than for IPv4. So it it, it, it close the gap or even you know uh, 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 change the change the wind. Uh, there are some explanation, um, but we don't have the time to go into detail why this is the case. Uh, increase link MTU if you can and change the choose the TCP MSS. These are all to avoid trying to avoid fragmentation because the fragmentation if it happens it will it will cause very high packet loss rate. And then there's this like announcing IPv6 route and uh, route filtering. Uh, Jeff Houston provided some example that you know if you don't do it, you basically provide one example that between Australia and Singapore. IPv4 is Australia to Singapore and directly back to, to Australia. But for IPv6, packet goes from Australia to Singapore, to Germany, to US, and then back to Australia. Then obviously you are going to have a lot higher uh, uh, round trip delay and possibly uh, packet loss. And then there's this packet filtering. I would say that here we provide some, some uh, references some references, uh, but more work probably need to be done, or at least you know we should you know uh, discuss and document these challenges, and then provide guidelines, provide a guideline on all of these. You know what can make IPv6 uh, better. So this is the second part, and the third part is looking forward. As we said, if you look at the world average, it seems like IPv6 seems to be a little worse. But if you look at, you know, deeper, actually, as we say, if you do IPv6 correctly, IPv6 can perform better than IPv4, just like in uh, America and in Europe. So if we look at the, the world today, I know that this is a busy slide and you will not be able to tell the company or read the small numbers. I think that there are only two impressions that I want to get, want you to get from this slide. First is that there are many companies with very high IPv6 uh, user percentage already. And starting from the, you know, the top one is 100% IPv6, and even the bottom one is still like 57%. It's still 57%. Um, as we said, uh, these are companies that do IPv6 uh, correctly and benefit from it. Um, 
they can already move to IPv6 only. They can already to move to IPv6 only. And Brian Carpenter told me that, you know, every time you talk about IPv6 only, you should immediately say that IPv4 as a service over IPv6. Because otherwise, people will say that, oh, this guy is a radical. How, 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 how can you be, you know, IPv4 will stay for uh, many, many years. They thought that IPv6 only means that no IPv4, but it's not the case. It just means that, you know, IPv4 will be run as a service over IPv6, but it will disappear from the infrastructure uh, layer. So it's the, the time to, to do so. And here, you know, will be a little bit more specific. So at least from an operator perspective, you know, Facebook already done it. I think that the hyperscale, the hyperscale have a lot of talents. They probably have, you know, the best talent in the industry and they have no problem, you know, they can, they, 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 they can do uh, whatever. But for some operators, it may not be so clear. So we kind of like, you know, uh, draw some picture um, I think that the mobile one, we kind of like use 464X a lot as an example. And the first one is a little bit like, uh, you know, like this light or, you know, one of those solutions. But the, the real difference is that I think that IPv6 only at the moment in the industry, you know, for some people, it just means the IPv4 as a service. Again, you know, it's just in the overlay. And here we want to make sure that, you know, by IPv6 only, we not only mean overlay, we really mean, you know, underlay. And the IPv4 packet will be tunneling inside IPv6, will be tunneling inside IPv6. We believe that this will further improve the performance of uh, IPv6 and make it better than IPv4. So this is uh, largely the, the, the kind of like the last slide before summary is that we, the difference between this one and the IPv6 overlay is that we believe that, you know, the, if you do, do the today's way, IPv6 overlay plus IPv4 underlay, you are basically, you, you, you have no exit strategy because you, your, your underlay is stuck, even though that your IPv6 traffic is increasing, but you know, you, you, you don't change your underlay and, and it, you always have, you know, two protocols. But you know, if you tunnel your IPv6 uh, traffic, IPv4 over IPv6, because oh, IPv4 is is uh, becoming a smaller and smaller percentage, then you know, one day you can finally just purely IP, purely IPv6. And really, this requires solving some of the challenges that we talk about in this uh, presentation. Um, 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 really, we need the, the help of IETF and the leading operators. We really need, first, we need to document all the challenges and provide a guideline. So this brings me to the summary. Again, we want to emphasize we, our feeling is that it's like a sophisticated machine. Only if you can install and operate it well, it will be better than IPv4. Otherwise, it can be worse then it can be worse than IPv4. And in this aspect, we really need, you know, IETF to kind of like provide kind of like better user guideline to make sure that, you know, uh, people will have a higher chance of, you know, install and operate it uh, correctly. Um, um, this, if we do this, then we can, we can, you know, accelerate the move to IPv6 and IPv6 only. And here we, we specifically uh, list some topic that we hope to get your contribution. I, I will pause here and let you uh, a few seconds to read it. Um, I also provide my contact information. So we'd love to, to hear from you. Thank you very much. I think you don't usually get a, 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 a applause, you know, in an IETF. So I feel really honored. <laughs> any any questions, comments? I cut in front of you last time. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not even the first in the queue. Whoever the first. So, Rajiv, do you want to speak? Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. So I yes. have a question. Uh, um, you talked about uh, there having been some work done to measure the performance improvement. Uh, and that performance improvement for IPv6 being larger than the performance improvement for IPv4 when you talk about uh, dealing with deep edge or deep in the network deployed content. So I, I was just wondering if you have any uh, study or uh, reference material that I can look at, uh, you know, because that is an area of great interest for me and the organization that I work for. And uh, we'd love to, we're, we're already kind of semi-dual stack, but we deploy in a lot of networks, which are still to this day, large, uh, you know, consumer facing ISPs that are IPv4 only. So we'd love to be able to show some statistics and you know try to help move the needle with these uh, you know medium mid-sized ISPs who you know have just not got onto the IPv6 bandwagon yet. Uh, okay, I I think that we should probably you know take this discussion offline because uh, it will it, one is it will take a lot of time and second you know I cannot remember you know all the or the you know the, the 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 reference so i can send you the reference afterwards i, I will definitely email you and we'll we'll take this up for offline but then um you know it, it this is a very interesting data point to have because we as service providers who are going into these deep network locations uh we would love to have some uh you know ammunition so that when we go to these providers who are reluctant to you know uh embrace ipv6 we have something that we can show them and say hey, it's in your interest to do this even though uh, you know you don't may not, you may not see a pressing commercial need to do it right now but hey, here's a case for a performance improvement for your customers that should uh, you know help you make the decision to go ahead and do this okay thank you rajiv uh john link over google as an enterprise operator who spent some time operating dual stack and v6 only network i have an impression that in my experience every single case when you see v6 performing worse than v4 is because of happy eyeballs because v6 network is broken nobody monitoring it because of happy eyeballs users are not complaining and it stays like that until you turn off ipv4 so i'm quite sure it's not something in the protocol, not something in the connectivity, it's just bad operational practices. Okay, yes, I think that that's, that's kind of what we are saying that, you know, the machine itself is fine, but you know, if you don't operate it correctly, uh, then it, it has problems. Barry. Hi, this is Barry Lieber. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you show the uh, performance differences in different regions? And I'm curious on that. Yeah, the, just you just passed it. Uh, no, go, go back the other way. Next one. That one. Um, do you have any sense of why Oceania is so bad compared with the other regions? Mm, I I don't. Okay. Because. I think that you know this is a slide that they, I newly add, and I, I today I went to the the uh, AP NIC data and copy this. I think that this, but I think that it's a, a a good question that we can probably discuss together with Jeff Houston. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hi, Mike Ackerman. First off, I want to say that you covered a lot of information. This is really good stuff. I hope you'll come back and do it again. It's almost inspirational. Thank you. Um, the uh, first question I want to ask, maybe somebody already did. Can we get copies of your slides? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, and then I just wanted to ask one specific question. I got your email. I got a whole bunch more, <laughs> so beware. Um, you had a slide that said, uh, and it's right up there, it's uh, that IPv6 performs better in enterprises. I'm one of those. Can you, is there a short answer as to why or how? Uh, we see it in this, 
for example, let me let me take Facebook as an example. You know, Facebook we 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 provide here. You know, it's a link to a YouTube video. And in this YouTube video, I believe that the person's name is Todd. Uh, well, it's a, a, a Facebook person talking about uh, IPv6. His IPv6 performance is better than IPv4. I, I remember it's in a nano meeting or in some kind of meeting. And then there are people uh, from, from the audience ask the same question. That you just ask. Yeah, we want to know and that they, secret. Those people, <laughs> I think that you know, uh, they provide some kind of. I, I I would not say that it's it's very direct answer. They say that well, for example, if you do IPv6, then you have no net. But really, uh, net uh, will introduce only a very small difference. So IPv6 is better. Is it really because of net or because of some other reasons? We didn't get a, a, a very clear answer from that uh, YouTube video. I think we have the reference okay. here. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can take a look at uh, yourself. I was hoping there was some great generic answer, but it, it could be application or situational specific, and that, that's certainly understandable. But. Yes, we actually, we really, I think that these are the questions that we should, we should dig into. And this is why we are doing this. And actually, maybe maybe Jane also you know, have some comments. Do you? For example, in your Google network, do you feel that IPv6 performs better or, you know, if it performs better, why? I, I definitely wrote down what she just said, that when you get to IPv6 only, and that makes a lot of sense. You can see where the economies of scale will start to add up and mm -hmm. give you better performance, maybe even holistically. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking for any answers anywhere I can get it, and this was great. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. So we are already uh, 5.30, and if there are no more questions, uh, I really want to... Uh... Rajiv, you have another question? One very quick question, uh, if it's not too late. Go ahead. Rajiv here. Go ahead, Rajiv. Yeah, so this is again uh, relating to the difference. Uh, so while uh, in this table, you're kind of showing the average uh, difference in the RTTs. Uh, and and yes, based on these numbers, uh, Oceania looks like it's a massive outlier with a much larger average. But uh, I probably am not as surprised by that because it's quite likely that the uh, overall total RTT average for connections in Oceania are probably going to be a whole lot higher because of the fact that it has very limited uh, capabilities of serving traffic locally and most traffic originating from there is reaching out to some other region of the world uh, in order to get served which is not the case with maybe um, americas uh, or europe or for that matter even asia because a lot of that traffic will be within the region okay so yes. a, a lot of asia is going to be served out of china or india or singapore and you know doesn't really have to go outside the region so when the total uh, connection rtts are say in the range of 40 or 50 milliseconds say a 10 percent difference turns out to be four milliseconds perfect for so oceania if they're if the average of their connections are mostly going uh, to be in the 300 and 400 millisecond rtt range because they're all going outside of the oceania region to get served a 10 percent differential in performance would still look like a very big difference over here. So I'm my question is, have you looked at that as a data point while doing this analysis? Uh, the, the short answer is no. As I said, you know, this slide I added today, you know, uh, upon the request of a colleague. But I, I can offer a, a observation is that, you know, if you know Jeff Houston, how he how he collects his statistics, is basically partnering with Google and, you know, uh, putting a kind of like an ad on the, you know, Chrome browser, and then this Chrome browser will contact his, you know, his, his, his prober, let's say. And then, um, because this is sampling, this is sampling. So I do the, the observation that, you know, 
uh, a different time, these can, you know, for example, tomorrow, if you go to, you know, Jeff Houston's side and then uh, take another snapshot, the number can be quite different. So I think that this is this is point number one. This you cannot definitely cannot, uh, you know, draw a conclusion that you know Oceania is always is always bad. So again, you know, all of these, you know, uh, every statistics, you must also look at it from, uh, you know, kind of like take it with a grain of salt, with a grain of, of salt. You know, really tomorrow you will when, when we look at the the one, and just now when you talk about the. The maybe you know Oceania is far away from counting, but again we are here we are talking about the difference between IPv4 and IPv6, and the long distance you know is a burden for both IPv4 and IPv6. So arguably you know it shouldn't create a lot of uh, difference. But other than that, really I'm sorry you know, uh, I, I I I really feel that that for IPv6 performance, uh, there are a lot of analysis is worth doing because we really, you know, know. I would say that we know very little. And um, if we we just support IPv6 and we don't face these challenges, they will not just go away. So I think that this is why, you know, I I I, I like to do this talk and kind of like expose these challenges and so that you know we can you know do something together. Thank you. That was very informative. Well, uh, let me thank all of you very much for spending the afternoon with us. I really appreciate it. And you got my contact information. Um, and we really love to, to hear from you. So again, bye now. Thank you so much. Uh,